Welcome to Interviews with Innocence, a podcast about spirituality, consciousness, and exploring the wisdom our children bring into this world. I believe that our very young children are our greatest teachers. After all, they're the masters of living in the present moment, bubbling in unconditional love, enjoying the messiness of life, and curious about the universe in all its dimensions. The pure essence that young children exhibit lives within all of us. My hope is that these interviews will help us discover, embrace, and connect with the sacred core of childhood that resides within each of our hearts. I am your host, Marla Hughes. Today, I am so excited to have David Lorimer on the show. David is a writer, lecturer, and editor who is program director of the Scientific and Medical Network, founder of Character Education Scotland, and former president of Reck and Trust and the Swedenborg Society. Originally a merchant banker and then a teacher of philosophy and modern languages at Winchester College, he is the author and or editor of over a dozen books, most recently, The Protein Crunch and A New Renaissance. He has edited three books about Peter Dunoff and Peter's spiritual name is, I'll let you say that, David. Is is Ben Zaduno. Yes, Ben Zaduno. Prophet for Our Time, The Circle of Sacred Dance and Gems of Love, a translation of Dunoff's prayers and formulas into English. Lormer is a founding member of the International Futures Forum and was editor of its digest, Omnipedia, Thinking for Tomorrow. He was a trustee of the St. Andrew's Prize for the Environment and a Churchill Fellow. His book, Prince of Wales, Radical Prince, has been translated into Dutch, Spanish, and French. His most recent book, which we'll talk a little bit about today and I am so excited about, is A Quest for Wisdom. He is the originator of the Inspiring Purpose Values poster programs, which have reached over 300,000 young people. David's mission is inspiring purpose, transforming worldviews, and living your truth. Welcome to the program, David. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's so nice to have you. So, wow, I, I've studied a lot about you. <laughs> you have quite the, you know, you've had quite the life. And I know that you're a prolific reader. All the interviews I, I listen to talk about how you're the best, most well-read person and giving reviews in, in the world, arguably in, in the world. So I commend you on that. So let's talk a little bit about when you were you when you you were young and your family. Yes, where where would you like me to start? In, in that I'd, like respect? You, I'd like for you to just start about your mom. I know she was clairvoyant, and your and your father. So just a little bit about that, and where your true inspiration as a child came from, which were your grand, grandfather and great grandfather. Yes, well, my, my family comes from Scotland, in fact, my, both, both sides of my family. My, my father's side, Lorimer's, came from Edinburgh. And uh, my great-grandfather, who you mentioned there, was Professor James Lorimer, who was the professor of international law at Edinburgh University and the author of a, a two-volume work called The Institutes of the Law of Nations, which really prefigured the United Nations and global democracy or the evolution towards global democracy in order to put an end to war. And this came out in 1883. And, and he, was a, he was also a moral philosopher. And then my, my grandfather was a famous architect, um, Sir Robert Lorimer, and he <clears throat> designed the Thistle Chapel and also the Scottish National War Memorial, as well as restoring a lot of houses and castles and designing these himself. And, and also I should mention gardens. And, and then on my mother's side, they, my mother was a Baxter from Dundee and they were jute merchants for 200 years and, and they helped found the Dundee University and Abitay University. They, the family gave the money um, for that. And so I was brought up in, in Scotland and um, my, my mother, as you mentioned, um, was, was sensitive and, and had some interesting experiences. And so I was opened up to that 
uh, dimension of things by by her experiences. Um, but my father couldn't be less interested in any, any of this. And when I wrote my first book in 1982, um, I did it over the summer holidays. And he, he told me, I th he thought I ought to be taking a break and enjoying myself instead of slaving away on writing my first book. And, and so, but he did actually read it. I have to, I have to really, I really have to commend him that he did actually sit down and read my, my book, Survival. And I, I like to think that it might have helped him in some way when he, he made his own transition, because I think so many people go over without any knowledge at all of what it's going to be like. It looks like not even having a map or any idea of what the map might look like. And, and so they, they, they might even find themselves in a, another extension and not realize that they've died. This seems to happen um, quite often um, and was actually written about as far back as the 18th century by Swedenborg. Yes. So how did you become interested in, in the afterlife? I, I'm kind of jumping ahead, but I know Swedenborg was a huge influence on you and I am such a fan of, of his work. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Yes, <clears throat> I mean, I, I've always, I was always actually interested in walking around cemeteries um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, they, people's dates and their descriptions and who they were. Uh, and so this, this gave me a sense of the, the preciousness of life, if you like, that we're here for a short time. You know, we have a date that we've, we've begun our lives and there will be an ending to it as well. So it will be an end date. And in fact, just as it happens, the, uh, the last poem I wrote um, was um, at a, 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 a sort of derelict um, cemetery and chapel about 10 days ago, very much about this whole business of the passing of time. Uh, and then my, my mother was, was interested, as was another family friend, um, in these, these topics. Um, so I, I, um, I felt that one needed to understand death and the nature of death if one was going to understand life. And so, so I, that, that was really my impulse for, for writing these first two books, uh, that uh, to, to review um, what had been thought um, about <clears throat> life, the afterlife or life beyond death, and also judgment and karma, and then see what the implications of that were for living one's life. And, and so I've, I've always taken life quite seriously uh, in that sense. Uh, and wanted to you know, to plumb its depths and, and find out what I could and write about this um, in order to be of some help to other people. Right. And do you think that your great, I think it was your great grandfather that used to wake up people early in the morning just to take them out to listen to the birds or go out into the garden? Or I know you mentioned that in one of your interviews. Well, that was Robert, <clears throat> and, and that he he woke people up at, at Gibbleston, which is where I grew up, uh, in order to um, get them to listen to the dawn chorus. Um, and yeah. I was I I I I, I, I wasn't up, but I, I could hear the dawn chorus this morning. Yeah. And and it's, it's now the time of year when the birds really have a go at singing before the sun rises, and it's just wonderful. It's kind of celebration of life. Right. Well, I know that you've been, we'll go back to Swedenborg in a second, but I know that you talk um, also about Dr. Albert Schweitzer, and I looked up his book that you refer to, Memoirs of Childhood and Youth, and I just want to uh, um, speak on a quick description of his book. It's autobiography, autobiography, and he tells of his first 19 years in the upper Alice, Alsace, 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 and its youthful discoveries of religion, music, and the inspiration of friendship. Even in his boyhood, there were traces of what was to become his reverence for life. As a boy, he writes, he managed to dissuade several companions from going fishing because of the pain he felt the deed gave to both the worm and the fish, and he goes on just to describe what a sensitive, what a sensitive child he was, and and memoirs of childhood and youth. 
it eventually led him to dedicate himself to medical service in African colonies. So does your childhood just the nature part of it and does it relate to what um, Dr. Schweitzer is talking about? Why was he, so, why did this touch you so much, his memoirs? Well, I didn't, the, the, my first encounter with Schweitzer was actually through his playing of Bach's organ music. Oh, um, because nice. my, my mother had these, these LPs, you know, long playing records. And I used to listen to those. And I, I really fell in love with that when I was about 15 or 16. And I, I, I taped them onto my, my, my very old tape recorder and I listened to them when I was at school. And, and so I've, I've had these preludes and fugues um, really running through my system. Um, and I have had, you know, for 50, more than 50 years. And so it wasn't until later that I found out about Schweitzer's life um, as a medical missionary and a musician. He had four doctorates. He had doctorate in philosophy, theology, uh, music and medicine. And, and uh, I read that, that book, um, which I also taught when I was at Winchester, because I think it's such a valuable book. Um, it's a short book for, for, for young people to read, uh, because not only does it um, talk about his, his life and how he started playing the organ when he was nine, and his sensitivity to nature, uh, and the fact that he was always a bit of an odd one out, um, with his his contemporaries, um, but it also talks at a later stage about ideals, and he he said he says that you should under no circumstances abandon your ideals, um, because if you think you're, um, you're you're lightening your craft, as it were, actually what you're doing is you're throwing out your supply of food and drink. And so he said, as you grow older, you should grow into your ideals, not abandon them. And I've never forgotten that uh, <clears throat> because I do regard myself as an idealist and um, as someone who's you know, striving for ideals. And I, uh, but at the same time, I realized that the, there, is, um, there, are, there are very severe shortcomings in human nature and human society. So one can't expect um, you know, perfection or, or even you know, really compassionate society to arrive anytime soon. But the important thing for me is to have that as your compass direction. So I, I often put it in this, I say, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work towards a culture of love and wisdom. And I, I got that for a little bit from Schweitzer, but also that, that brings one um, back to, to Swedenborg, as you, you mentioned before. Yeah. I also heard you mention that you were a sensitive child and, and felt like you didn't fit in at times. So I'm sure that you could relate to some of his stories too. And I think it all brings it back full circle, circle that now you're working with young people because it's mm -hmm. such a big part of such an influence on you and and relating it to your own. Yes, I mean, that was, that. I think that, that if you get through these difficulties, then it does make you stronger. Uh, and um, another thing I just wanted to mention is that uh, when I was a child, I spent a lot of time climbing trees mm -hmm. and, and I, would, I would spend, you know, an hour or so or more up a tree during the afternoon. And, and this was really a kind of, I realized um, looking back on it, kind of communion with nature and um, that uh, I was generally being in the tree and, and I can still see the, the leaves fluttering and the view down to the bottom and, and just the, the peace of being um, at one um, with one of one's favorite trees. Right. I, I certainly can relate to that. I, I grew up on a farm in Indiana and we had pigs and chickens and I spent a lot of time out in the in the oak trees and by the river and and just lying there and looking at the you know looking at the clouds and it's it's just beautiful how you can just recall those memories you know even though you were very young and that's why we know it's so important for our young people today they're not getting enough of those experiences i don't think too much screen and not enough nature yeah <laughs> Yes. And as one of, I was going to say, as one said, too much doing and not enough being. 
and we'll talk about that in a bit. Yes. So Swedenborg, yes. I, I was so excited that you, he was one of your, I guess I'll call him a, a mentor, um, because I've I've studied him some and I've just been so fascinated by him. So share a little bit about him and why his teachings were were so profound for you. Well, I, I came across him you know, via my study of French literature mm -hmm. in, in the last um, year of, of university at St. Andrews, because I was reading a Baudelaire poem, which is called Correspondences. And in the notes, it said that this idea of correspondences came from Swedenborg. And I'd also seen other references to Swedenborg, for instance, uh, Balzac was, in, was influenced by him. And I was studying about some of Balzac's novels, not the one Seraphita, which is apparently inspired by Swedenborg. Uh, and so I, I, I got the a biography of him by, by Trowbridge out of the library. And I, I stayed in one evening and, and, and started reading it. And I was absolutely riveted um, because here was a man who was actually one of the great engineers and scientists of his day. And, and he wrote you no know, 700 page book on the brain, um, for instance, and he was an engineer. He had plans for um, flying machines and submarines, a bit like Leonardo in that sense, or he had no artistic um, ability like Leonardo. Uh, and so I, I thought, well, I then got started getting more, more of his books out. And, and I, soon I went to London and I joined the Swedenborg Society and I bought quite a few of his central works. And I suppose the two most important ones to mention are Heaven and Hell, where he describes his experiences and encounters with people who've, moved, who've passed through the veil and on the other side. Uh, and some very, very interesting um, stories um, uh, around that or rise around that. And then the other one was called Divine Love and Wisdom. And there was a big fat term that I read probably in 1975 or so called the true Christian religion. And I was struck by the centrality of love and wisdom. And also by the way that he said that the wine and the bread um, corresponded to, to love and wisdom respectively. And so communion was in fact the reception of love and wisdom symbolized by the wine and the bread. And I, I find this a much, much more congenial idea um, than this literal idea of, of the, the vicarious sacrifice and the atonement, um, which Swedenborg himself didn't really believe in. Um, and so his was a deeper spiritual sense um, of the Bible and symbolism and life. Wow, how I, I grew up in a Christian church, a very small one, and you know, we had communion regularly, how different it would be for a young person for it to be presented to them that it's love and wisdom and then draw upon that for, you know, other, other Bible studies or whatever, you know, the teacher is doing. And while you're in church, that would just be so, be so different. Um, can you tell the story just because the listeners love these stories? Or I think they do. I love these stories <laughs> about when he found the receipt for his widow or there was. Um, can you tell that story? Yes, that's one of the great stories. Um, and because the, the philosopher Kant, uh, he, he wrote a, a scurrilous book about Swedenborg called Dreams of a Spirit Seer. But he did check these various stories out, including the Stockholm fire and this one, which is about the. The, the, the Marteville receipt. So Baron de Marteville, who was an ambassador, uh, he, he died and his widow received a bill um, for something which he thought um, he'd already paid for before he died, but there was no evidence for this. And so she consulted Swedenborg and Swedenborg said, well, I'll, um, um, I'll, I'll have a word with uh, your, your late husband and ask him where, where it is or if, he's, if he knows where it is. And after a week or so, he, he went back round and said, yes, it's, he said exactly where it is. It's in his bureau, his, his old desk. And if you, if you look at, look, if you pull out this drawer, and then you'll find there's a secret drawer which pulls out at right angles. And, and in that drawer was a receipt. And, and it's, it, it, there's really, if you look at the whole evidence for survival, it's a very good um, piece of evidence 
And because when it comes to the crunch, there are only two theories that you can use. One is that the, the mind does survive death, and therefore it, that's what Swedenborg is describing exactly what happened to him, i.e. he communicated with um, the spirit of Varald of Marteville. Or you know, it's a kind of um, super ESP, as they say, where everything is, is available as a memory, and you, you tune into that memory, but there's no actual survival. And, and this to me is, is, I mean, it corresponds to the Akashic records, but it, it's not a very economical um, hypothesis because um, it, it's really not specific enough. And, and so I, did, I would trust Swedenborg. Swedenborg says, I spoke to this, this man, mm -hmm. and then I would take him at his word. Right. And, and it's, it's, a, it's one of the stories that is, as I say, it's, it, the interest of it is that the widow did not know where this receipt was. Uh, and the Swedenborg got the information, um, which he couldn't otherwise have known. Yeah, yeah. And there are so many amazing mediums out there that, I, that I've either seen or I've interviewed that this evidential, you know, the evidential um, things that they bring through, just like Swedenborg, or it's just irrefutable, really, in my mind, but so fascinating. So let's jump ahead to Peter Dunoff, because he's your, he was so influential. So can you briefly talk about, about that experience? Yes, well, I first came across his, his work in 1985. Um, well, I, I ordered a book called Cosmic Moral Laws, um, by one of his um, disciples, who was a teacher in his own right, called Mikhail Omran Mikhail Ivanov. Uh, and I took it to Crete. I went to Crete to, on holiday with my brother. And I read it and I thought to myself, this really is profound stuff. And I was interested in the whole title, you know, Cosmic Moral Laws, because if there are cosmic moral laws, then we need to know about them and practice. Them. Otherwise, we're going to finish up in a lot of trouble. And so he, he spoke, he referred to his teacher, Peter Dunoff. And so when I got back, I ordered actually complete works of Ivanov, which is about 60 volumes. And um, not, they're not all very long. And there were two sets. There was a white set and then a smaller paperback set. And I, I just, I, I read my way through all of that over a period of months. And in the second chapter of volume one, there is an account of, um, of, of Peter Dunoff and the influence that he had and um, on Ivanov. And I immediately intuitively knew that this was the source of the most um, profound teaching which was coming, coming through. And, and so I, I made arrangements. To, I, there was actually very little available in English at the time. Um, a little, one or two books had been published around 1970 by Sunrise Press in the US. Um, but there was more available in French. And as, as I was a French teacher, it wasn't any trouble for me to read these books in French. And so I, when I went to Paris, I found half a dozen books. And then I also found um, about 20 years worth of periodical, um, which is called The Grain of Wheat, um, Le Grain de Blé. And, and so I read my way through all of that. And, and then I met a Bulgarian woman um, who was living in the local village. And so I started taking lessons um, in Bulgarian. And, and so I learned the language before I went first in 1989, um, which is before the Berlin Wall came out, came down. So we're still, you're still talking about really a police state, um, which Bulgaria was at the time um, and, and, and had been effectively since um, Peter Dunoff died in 1944. And just for the listeners, um, once again, Peter Dunoff's um, spiritual name was Benza Duno. Benza Duno, that's right. And he, what he, what he explained was that his his teaching was was the same, came from the same source as the the teaching of Christ, and and there there are very close parallels, not only with that esoteric Christianity, but also with the movement in the 11th century in Bulgaria called the Bogomils. And um, Bogomil literally means dear to God. And they were the Bulgarian Cathars, if you like, or the Cathars were in a sense, the French Bogomils. Mm -hmm. And there, there, there was a, 
a relationship there um, and an emphasis on on the mystical side um, of Christianity and and on the Gospel of John. Um, but more recently, I've come to understand um, that the Gospel of John is maybe may well be a redaction or an edited version of an earlier manuscript called the Gospel of the Beloved Companion. And the beloved companion is Mary Magdalene, not John. So this is quite heretical in some senses, but there's work coming out in this field now, which I think will reinstate Mary Magdalene in a major way. Yeah. Wow. That's interesting. And you say that um, the Erdini Mountains are your spiritual home. Why, why is it because of these retreats and the experiences that you had there? Well, yes, the, 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 the seven lakes, just to explain the geography here, uh, there are seven lakes, which is the, the area um, or where the camp was traditionally, you know, had, and has been since 1929. Um, and then if you go over the ridge and down into the next valley, uh, then you get to the Udini lakes. And, and because there's now a, a ski lift, <clears throat> and and people can get up there much more easily. Wow. Um, the whole atmosphere um, has has changed, and, and you know, occasionally people have transistor radios and iPods and iPads and all those sort of things, and so a lot of noise. And so it, it's not at all what it used to be. Even when I first went there, when there was no ski lift and no hotel, and um, because you you could only get up there by walking three hours. Um, and uh, 1,000 meters, so it's it's a big it's a big climb. It's climb from 1,200 meters to 2,200 meters. Wow! So if you go over the ridge, then you get into this um, completely unspoiled area, um, which is absolutely magical, and it's 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 as if there's really no human mental, emotional, and spiritual pollution there. There's, <clears throat> it's absolutely pure. The water is completely clear. There's no you know, run off from um, fertilizers and all of that. <clears throat> so you, you get this real sense of, of purity and light, um, which is extraordinarily freeing. Um, and uh, I, I had that I'd walk on the you know, 2nd of August 2017, where I just had a magical day all on my own. Um, and uh, I was just sort of drinking it in. So people still do that and you, that small area, 2017, so that was what, four years ago, is is that area still, pure? Can, can people go there and? Yes, I mean, you. And what you need to do is really have your own tent. Right. Well, that's and have everything on your back. Right. And then what, what you can do, and I, I've never done this yet, but apparently it's a, it's a three day walk from that area to the Rila Monastery. And the Rila Monastery is the great sacred, you know, uh, Orthodox shrine uh, in Bulgaria because the, the, the incorrupt body of St. John of Rila um, is still there. Um, and you can see his body is dried out, but it hasn't rotted. Yeah. And so <clears throat> that's all quite interesting as well. Yeah. Is that one of the things that you want to do? Yes, I'd, I'd like to do that at, at, at some point. Um, but uh, I haven't planned it yeah. yet. So, um, or you could get you could do that by horse as well if you were right. Um, right. Were able to do that because uh, well, a lot of the luggage comes up by horse because you can't you can't get it up, including the food and the, and the big tents and everything. And so it's rather nice that you know horses are still used in the way that they were a hundred years ago. Yeah. yeah. Well, those sorts of places are hard to find, and they they are so so magical so moving forward you became director of the scientific and medical network and i know you're chair of also the galileo commission who um, i heard about from dr evan alexander when i when i interviewed him so can you tell us a little bit about those organizations yes uh, the scientific and medical network was founded in 1973 um, by some senior people with a background in education science and medicine, as you might expect. Mm -hmm. And they were all concerned that medical and scientific students were being indoctrinated with a materialistic understanding 
which is probably even more the case now than it was you know, 50 years ago. Um, and what people don't realize, or most scientists and doctors don't realize, is that this, is, this philosophy is not necessary um, in order to be a scientist. In other words, you can have a spiritual philosophy and be a scientist, rather than being committed to materialism and the idea that the brain gives rise to consciousness and that there is no possibility of any kind of extrasensory perception, no possibility of survival, no possibility of children remember previous lives. Uh, all of this is actually ruled out um, by, by this materialistic understanding. And so <clears throat> what they wanted to do was to, to, to explore this interface uh, between science, spirituality and consciousness. And we, we've been running conferences along these lines um, you know, for, for many years. And the Mystics and Scientists Conference, which I've been organizing for over 30 years, that uh, began in 1978. And then I instigated the Beyond the Brain conferences with the Institute of Genetic Sciences in 1995. And so those are now every year. So I'm planning that one for November this year. And I think the Mystics and Scientists going to be at the end of July because the um, pandemic meant that we had to cancel it last year and we've got no live meetings <clears throat> this year everything's online right. and so the Galileo Commission um, was set up about four years ago and the idea the metaphor that we're using there is, is to ask or request or suggest that scientists uh, look through the telescope at um, evidence that actually calls into question the adequacy of this idea that everything is material, that matter is primary. And, and so we, we commissioned a report by Professor Harold Wallach um, to, to look into this whole area <clears throat> of those sort of spiritual and psychic experiences, uh, but also philosophy of science, and to make it clear that, that there is an underlying philosophy to science or to anything, if you like, you can't get away from that. So there are assumptions and presuppositions. And the primary one, so far as psychology, philosophy, and neuroscience is concerned, in this respect, is that the brain produces consciousness. And this, if you think this, then it, it, that's a, it's a theory that works very well um, on the whole until it comes to near-death experiences, right. out-of-body experiences, apparitions, children remember previous lives, extrasensory perception, all of that can't be explained by a materialistic understanding. And so that looking through the telescope means looking at this evidence rather than dismissing it or pretending it doesn't exist. And this was a position with the professor of philosophy at Padua, who Galileo said, I tried to get him um, to uh, look through the telescope, look through my glass, but he, he resolutely refused to do so. And I just don't think it's good enough for scientists to refuse to look at evidence um, because it seems like it contradicts um, this underlying philosophy, which is not science, as I've just emphasized. Right. Yes, it doesn't seem- so We've got a summit coming up quite soon. We've, we've got these, these summits that we're, we're running and Eben is going to be talking in one in May. And um, so the next one is the 9th and 10th of April, um, where we've got some round tables with some of the leading consciousness researchers and that that's online right and that's online yeah so your listeners can certainly um, find the details of that yes uh, and i think so i think there there is some movement um, in in the field and more and more people are taking the fundamental nature of consciousness seriously and and even in academic philosophy and um, there's a move towards at least panpsychism, the idea that, um, that, that matter and um, mind, in a sense, are, are complementary. You can't, you, you can't separate one from the other, which at least is better than imagining that um, consciousness is like steam coming out of a kettle um, when you can't even have free will. That's what, that's what technically called epiphenomenalism, something very difficult to to, to pronounce, but it's the idea that, that, that the consciousness is just a byproduct and has no capacity to, to do anything, right. which is manifestly nonsense so far as our own um, experience is concerned. 